Um, okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, that felt like quite a short break, but we've got a question coming up. Um, I wanted to introduce our next facilitator for session two, um, and that's Sean Agus. So Sean is the Public Engagement Coordinator at University College London um, in Sport Neurology and has recently been seconded um, to become the Public Engagement Manager at the School of Medi Medical and Life Sciences, also at DPL. Um, and I thought it was funny, and I, this actually hasn't been something that our um, coordinating team has discussed, but both of our facilitators um, have been or are public engagement managers, um, which I think is interesting because I think they have a real insight into um, managing challenges in collaborative projects. So I'm going to hand you over to Sean. Thank you for joining us and for agreeing to facilitate Sean, who's going to tell you more about herself um, and introduce some of the breakout sessions. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, actually, my, my role has recently changed again. <laughs> I'm one week into a job with the National Coordinating for Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement here in the UK. Um, and I'm also a PhD researcher um, interested in community engagement and public engagement um, practice and, and exploring that and, and the use of the arts and that around medical research primarily. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been working in the field in the UK and internationally for around two decades. And yes, I, I'd say that a lot of what was discussed um, earlier very much resonates. <laughs> a lot of the challenges mentioned, um, which are also challenges that um, were given um, we were given some great headlines through the Connectors Collaborative Research. Um, which are on this slide here are very common and I think across different contexts different people recognize the same challenges and think of different drivers and solutions um, to those challenges so I think that's what this session will primarily focus on trying to understand the root causes of these and how we can work towards addressing them and who perhaps needs to take responsibility for them because I know that it's, it's very often connected themselves that pick up the slack and do a lot of invisible work and it's not <laughs> it's not um, always as rewarded as it ought to be and there's not always the time that's required for it or the resource that's required for it so let's make this stuff visible in this session um my background i suppose when it comes to collaboration has primarily orientated around engagement work using the arts um, and working within the context of medical research. So collaboration in interdisciplinary research projects in a way. So the arts and artistic research and medical research, which are pretty as much as divergent as you can get. <laughs> so one that's very exploratory in its nature, that doesn't necessarily have um, a lot of regulation or systems around it. Um, that is open to changing tack and changing direction and, and finding the nub of an issue and going for it in as a project emerges, that's the arts. And then medical research, which is a lot more formalized, um, has some structures around it and in institutions and cultures around it that are pretty entrenched very often and are less comfortable with openness and emergent and the kinds of way that research and, under, and, and knowledge is understood within the arts. Yet there are huge, huge um, potential potentials around these sort of projects coming together um, in terms of informing a research agenda, bringing in um, you, the, the community perspectives, different standpoints and and concerns and considerations that would be missed otherwise. Um, actually checking um, the research question and the research frame itself and trying to understand it from different standpoints and viewpoints and ultimately making research stronger and making it more solutions focused and, and orientated towards real world change and doing something really valuable. So there's huge potential um but from the projects that i've been involved in i have to say it's it's never gone according to plan <laughs> there are always slips and there are always challenges i've worked on a couple of um participatory arts research projects in nepal working with 
water, um, researchers in waterborne disease. Um, one was sacred water, in which researchers' role was to be an audience for um, some participatory art research around women and women's perceptions of water and the significance of water to them culturally and in their own lives. Another in which we again looked at um, water and enteric disease and, and the problem and tried to understand the problem and this was with a group of young people. In this instance, researchers were brought in in various instances, almost as resources and informants, um, and, and again, as an audience. And so there's a lot of struggling to try and create those spaces in which to bring these two groups together and to manage those conversations and those exchanges in a way that would be meaningful and, and addressing, as we've, as we've discussed, some of those challenges around power and power dynamics. Um, more recently, working with the Institute of Neurology at the at, at University College London, Again, I admit um, this was a project working with stroke survivors, an artist and, and neuroscientists and on paper everything was beautifully planned. It really was intended to be a piece of interdisciplinary research, but again, when, when push came to shove, there were challenges and research um, commitment wasn't as the, the commitment of the academic researchers wasn't necessarily as as there as it was intended to be at the outset. Um, so there are definite things that I think a lot of us probably have insights into and this conversation will be helpful in elucidating that are, are pulling researchers in terms of scientific researchers um, in terms of their time in terms of um, their tolerance of risk, perhaps, or in terms of their understanding of what a project is and, and what's expected of them within it. Um, so yeah, these, these are the five challenges. I think this would be good grist for the mill for the conversations that are coming up. Um, so this challenge, as I've mentioned, around commitment of researchers in particular, and, and what is it that is causing the slippage in a lot of cases, not all, um, but in a lot of instances um, in which the, the interactions aren't as strong or plentiful or multiple as, as were intended at the outside. Um, num a number of, of connectors identified that partners are resistant to, to change and adaptation. And let's think a bit about what what the drivers might be around that, what structural forces are at play, what, what's going on for them, let's try and be compassionate to them and their needs, and, and what are the risks um, involved stepping out of your discipline into somebody else's practice um, and changing and adapting your way of working, especially when it's quite formalised discipline. Um, problems with relationships and power dynamics, I mean, that, that is definitional of these kinds of projects um, but yeah quite often we can feel that we're working with a pronounced hierarchy of knowledge in which certain approaches to knowledge are um, awarded more power they're perhaps the ones with the funds holding the purse strings than other approaches to knowledge or people with other world views who are here in the collaboration. So how do we how do we work with that and how do we address that and how do we try and create a more even playing field? Um, as we've mentioned, there are often very different ambitions at play within a project because we have multiple stakeholders and standpoints and, and their own ambitions and values and priorities. And that's okay. That's very often, I mean, again, you'd expect that. But how do we know from the outset which of those are in synergy, which of those are the ultimate priority of the project? Because the primary ambition is likely to shape the whole project. And also, again, the terminologies that we use perhaps are a bit too baggy for us to know that we have agreement when it comes to the ambitions of the project and the direction we'd like it to go in, terms such as engagement, terms such as research. Um, mean different things to different people and so um, arriving at a common understanding is a tricky process so how can we 
better support that and make sure it comes out early on and we've got agreement early on rather than it coming out in the wash when tensions arise. And again, this uh, Herculean um, load that very often connectors are taking on and people that do it well have amazing skills in terms of project management and budget management and planning, but there will be the unexpected. And also alongside this, you're, you're holding a lot of things, you're, you're building relationships, you're managing relationships, you're spinning plates. Um, and, and this works often invisible, it's often under the force line. Um, so how do we recognize that and recognize this this relational work that is going on and how do we equip people to have the, the right resource, including time in order for a project to succeed. So that's that's a high level sort of overview of, of, of some of these challenges. Um, but luckily we have four willing volunteers who are happy to put some flesh on these bones. Um, we have Joanne Passmore, who is an associate professor at the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Richard Kilpert, who's an art ed educator at the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary African Art in South Africa. Stacey Hardy, writer, journalist, artist and performer in South Africa. And Madhushri Kamak, who's a program manager at the Bengaluru Science Bengaluru Science Gallery in India. Um, so we're going to split into four breakout groups now. Um, so you'll be assigned to one of those speakers. Um, oh, lovely. So we have the instructions here. Um, so it'd be great if when you're in your breakout room, turn on your camera um, and your microphone. And as I mean, as far as you're able to introduce yourselves and, and agree um perhaps to keep as far as is possible what you're sharing anonymous in the feedback and it would be great if someone would volunteer to take notes and to feed back the conversations that you're having into the plenary which will happen in 25 minutes time um then your speaker will describe their project talk through the work and their challenges um, and we have about 10 minutes in which they can do that and then please have a discussion and, and think about sharing your own experiences and looking for parallels within it. And think about the drivers behind some of those challenges that have been discussed and whose responsibility are some of those drivers and, and what could be done um, if we're going to challenge those, those problems and come up with something that works for people in a better way. And you can blue skies that, you can tell the funder what they need to do um just that we don't know who's listening we don't know who's going to hear this um so now's your chance to to voice what you need to voice um so i believe we're going to be going into breakout rooms now and we'll see you back here in 25 minutes time so that will be um at 10 past two if that's correct 10 past two uk time sorry i'm not I'm in the UK, so ten, the equivalent in your own time zone. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'll just wait a little while to make sure that we have everyone in the room again. Good discussion. Thumbs up. Thumbs down. <laughs> Thumbs up and smiles. Brilliant. <laughs> Great, okay. There you go. Hello everyone, welcome back. I hope that was a fruitful discussion for you all. Um, we have about 10 minutes. Um, in those 10 minutes, it would be great to hear from each group. Um, so I'll go around. There were only three groups in the end and three contributors. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go through the actual case study that you discussed, but I'm hoping that there are pertinent lessons that will probably transcend all projects of this kind. So 
let's start, let's just jump right in and start with the group that work with Richard um, and your volunteer note taker. Um, and coming here to, we'll go around each group and hear the two most high level challenges that you discussed and you got into um, and what you thought of in terms of any of the drivers and if you got to the idea, any ideas around solutions to those, it'd be good to hear them. And we'll give you um, about two minutes per group. So who worked with Richard? Who was the note taker in Richard's group? Please feel free to take your camera um, off. I, I, I'm, I was the note taker, uh, but we couldn't really touch upon the challenges. So Richard, do you want to share the challenges quickly? And, and then we can, uh, I can add uh, to that if, if you're there. No. No. Seem like she's there. Um, let's, let's I think you're about... muted, Richard. You're muted. <laughs> how, oh. how, how often have I heard that? Um, so, so a lot of the challenges. Um, well, one of the challenges with that project that I spoke about, which was a sort of interactive uh, commission for museum display um, aimed particularly at children and families was um, when we commissioned it from the students, there was this notion that what is a story from Africa? Because we um, there was cultural um, significance to uh, starting with a, a children's story or a folk story or what is a folk story and who owns uh, an origin story, um, an Adam and Eve story, a story about a hyena and, and the kangaroo, whatever it's, a, you've got, um, there were there were cultural issues that had to be over, overcome and it was particularly particularly amongst the white students at, at tertiary level who who felt that they had no right to represent or the challenge was to make a, an artwork an interactive artwork that worked with the story that you chose and um and so there, there was this, this tentative, I've seen it with a lot of um, post, oh, um, undergraduates in the last five years here in South Africa, where particularly in the arts, the creative arts, where there's a, a, a complete wariness and an almost muteness in engaging with who, uh, what is a, an, a, an important story to tell, what, who tells whose story. And uh, it's been quite a, a different challenge as an educator to um, coax this, the, 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 just the ability out, you know, you'd, you'd have people who would do something and then hide it from you, or, you know, they had an offering to exhibit in, in this prestigious museum and rather withdrew from the project rather than put their, their foot in it. And so it was, uh, for those who stayed with it and we, we gave many entry points to the project, there was an opportunity to, um, to to work through it and work collaboratively as well but um so the cultural ideas uh, the, the the background getting to know each other's stories took six months and so that was uh, quite a, a quite a, a that was probably our key challenge we had funding for it um the other challenge was working within an institution um the a museum has very strict rules and having public access and having work happening in the museum building installations and stuff that are not commissioned by the the lords of the curatorial office was quite a difficult one and our final one was probably the access for the audience we really had to pay for the transport to bus people in to come and see the actual exhibition um we are sort of isolated geographically like like uh, apartheid was very clever in 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 uh in in South Africa, so the the sort of city is far away from the people who, who work at, in the city, and so um, that was our final challenge: was how do we create access for this? And one of our solutions has been now to now take the project further and take it to schools. Great, thank you very much. So I guess there's there's stuff that's likely to have resonated with others, and um, definitely around this issue of working across cultures and. And can so I add language? Uh, language, and language. Yeah, yeah, there were a lot, what there were at least four languages. Mean? Yeah, and, and the risk and the fear involved in that, um, and, and how people feel around that, whether or not they're going to wade in and tread on toes or, or not wade in whatsoever, and how, how you deal with that is probably something 
people have experienced within their own context. Um, and and I, I'm guessing that was unpredictable, that sticking point. You didn't predict that. And so suddenly six months was added to your timeline. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there we have one of those unpredictable curveballs thrown in. Um, yeah, and this idea of different institutions and their and their processes, how you access money and funding and and the rules within those organizations and how you navigate those as somebody who's not from that institution um, and, and collaborating with others with their, their own um, cultures, I suppose, and ways of doing things. And yeah, and that question around access and, and where do you find the space to, to bridge these groups of people? What kind of spaces do we use? And, and how do we enable people to enter the same space and, and address those issues of power? That, that are deep rooted and historical in nature. Thank you very much, Richards. Um, let's move on to the next group. Um, so the group that worked with Stacy. do you have a volunteer note taker who's happy to feedback? Hello, greetings to all. I just, if I can first just say, I also just okay. quickly, very quickly say that I, I also, I, I didn't manage the time in the group very well. So I think I talked for too long, so we didn't have enough time for feedback and an apology to everyone in the group for that. Thank, thank you, Stacey. I, I noted a few points that I could like to, I would like to share with the group. Yeah, right. Uh, right. we had Stacey, Nabil, myself, Yusra, Sheleka, Ambewe, we had Lindsay, Diesel, and uh, Dokas. So uh, Stacy gave us a, a brief, uh, a brief uh, background. It was brief, this, this, just uh, <laughs> despite the fact that she said she didn't manage the time well, we were able to grasp us a few points uh, that it started in uh, 2018 and uh, she had uh, suffered uh, tuberculosis without knowing. And out of this, uh, she came up, she was being an artist, she came up with, uh, with the other artists and they used to correspond and share uh, like emails and letters. And out of this, you know, this, is, this was a challenge. Out of this uh, collaboration that they came together, they gave birth to Palmona Graphics, graphics uh, and this was funded in the 2020 the, during the uh, Corona. And uh, with these correspondences, it, the correspondences gave birth to a syllabus and were able to offer lectures at the University of Chicago. So you see a challenge and a positive outcome here. And uh, they had uh, music, music, films and reading. And uh, they had, uh, you know, among the syllabuses that they taught, attack against breath. And this came in very well during the, when Floyd was, uh, you know, died, I cannot breathe. So out of this uh, syllabus teaching, they wanted to search for more uh, teaching sites just so that it doesn't like focus America alone. And uh, they also began to, they, they found the, there was this funding, finding form through the power, power dynamics Maybe she, may, she will elaborate on that. Then the University of Education, uh, the point that I took at this point was uh, the University of Education can come up irrespective of the background. They were in South Africa, but you see they were able to offer classes in Chicago. Then uh, Nabil came up with a question and uh, sharing with the TB background on how the uncle suffered and uh, having worked at the mining, and uh, the desire for the uncle was to, you know, to have the employers be passionate with the staff. So this was also a takeaway point in this uh, discussion that if we have uh, staff, let's be passionate. Let's talk to them. Yeah. Then, uh, then the, I think that that was uh, what I, the last, uh, the last point that I, I took home was let's acknowledge this was brought up by Stacy that let's acknowledge the anecdotes the side charts you know the messages because these anecdotes they end up being the syllabus or the main stories That's so thank you all thank you all
Thank you, Joy. Thank you very much. So there are, um, we don't have a huge amount of time, but Stacey, jump in if you can. But it sounds like you've done a very reactive and responsive project that was working with things in a shifting context. Yeah, I mean, I think the things to highlight with, with us was that because of the shifting context and that, but also because I was working, one of the things that we won't talk about is that the group who ended up being the project came from very different backgrounds, a social science researcher from the University of Chicago, myself, a, a writer, a musician. So, but one of the things that we really explored or that I found really useful was trying to find form. So this question of what form does a project take and are there ways that we can be exciting or use form in a really interesting way that can perhaps bring skills together that sometimes it's not you know we have these formulaic forms of the project but what happens if we throw that out the box or, or how you normally work what are the form new forms that could be forged in the synergy so that's really i think one of the biggest learning curves of our project is also to think about form sometimes the last thing we think about is what form does this project take but it was really key and we moved from using this idea of the performance lecture, um, largely because we were, I, he was a lecturer and a researcher, I'm a performer, Neo's a performer, a musician, and we came up with this idea of the research, of the, the, re, the performance lecture as a form that would bring our skill together. Then again, the syllabus became a form, correspondence became a form. So for one, one of the things that was really interesting to take away from that was, was form, and then as it's in the personal story that that was the kind of anecdote thing it's very often the small stories on the side the 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 little sharing of personal life anecdotes that the importance of those not to overlook them um yeah, yeah. great so it sounds like you you created a space in which that serendipitous had a place that serendipitous yeah, yeah, yeah. come in and and it sounds like what you did, I'm not that hot on the definitions of multidisciplinary, <laughs> interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, but it sounds like you were pushing towards something which was inventing a new, a new approach for everybody and everybody was, was, was coming out of their comfort zones. And, and that sounds very yeah. difficult to manage, but also created something new. Um, and and that's, that's almost the holy grail, but of course, that kind of project will encounter challenges. <laughs> way. Way. Well done for navigating them. Let's move on to the third group. So this is Madhushri. And can we please have the note taken from that group? Just two very quickly high level reflections on the challenges that were faced. Do we have somebody? I'm not sure uh, if anyone was able to take notes, uh, but I can like maybe quickly just share something. And I think Zandil also wanted to share a couple of points that uh, she noted. Um, so I think we spoke a bit about the online and to see uh, how was that a challenge that we were dealing with specifically given the current situation of how everything has had to go online so what does that mean specifically when we look back at our audiences uh, what are the new challenges that we're facing and the difficulties in recreating what a physical public engagement experience is from the ground to uh, a digital space where it's gone from being two way to one way and what are the new kinds of tools and how much resistance we face in the acceptance of this kind of method, uh, even though this was the only option available at this point of time. So uh, I think that is what we sort of discussed and how do the various kinds of power plays come back into this because of technology? And if there are any solutions around this, what does this mean in terms of the extra work in on our end as connectors to be able to facilitate this and make this transition easier? Uh, both for the experts who are coming in, but also for the young people or the publics to whom we are going. So uh, I think that was sort of what we focused on. And I think Zandil might want to add um, something. 
Yeah, no, definitely. Um, it was definitely that, um, and just really just getting the commitment from researchers. So that was like the two high level um, issues that we, we we really wanted to discuss. We just didn't have enough time to to do so. But so we were really also wanting to hear from others in terms of how they've been able to mitigate that in terms of getting um, that uh, a commitment from researchers and also uh, mitigating how you've transitioned now from face to face um, to online and how you're not able to now reach um, um, you know as much or, or the, the mass population as you would you would like yeah thank you very much I think that online um, question and, and the new things that arise out of questions around digital poverty and who has access to online and who doesn't we might be reaching new groups and, and people who wouldn't ordinarily be reached yet we might be excluding others and we're all just venturing into that and thinking about it in new ways I, I these are all strands of conversations that I think would be wonderful to take forward and there might be a way to take forward. So um, I'll, I'll leave it with um, the team behind the scenes to, to think about how that could happen. But thank you so much. It sounds like you had rich discussions, even though you didn't solve everything, which I'm thoroughly disappointed about. <laughs> um, I didn't expect you to, but um, well done for unpacking some stuff and, and, and diving in there wholeheartedly. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand back now. Thank you very much, everyone, for the um, reflections on the breakout. And Sean, thank you very much for facilitating and help, helping us to catch up on some time. Um, we're a little bit over time, and we've just got two quick sessions to go now. Um, the first is going to be a reflection from Professor Dorcas Kamoya. Um, Dorcas is a Wellcome Trust Society and Ethics Fellow and also the currently, currently the head of the Health Systems and Research Ethics. Dorcas does a lot, um, but her current fellowship is focused on empirical ethics and if and how communities can be effectively get engaged on complex topics. So really relevant work for all of our discussions. Um, so thank you very much for taking up the offer to do some reflections, Dorcas. I thank you very much to all of you. And uh, uh, noticing how much quick time has gone, and this is definitely a topic that is of very keen interest to me. I would just very quickly, I think, give a very uh, high level kind of summary. I hope you can hear me. We can hear okay, you okay, all. Perfect, thank you, thank you. I'll just give a very high level kind of summary. Uh, what I heard coming all through is that um, any interdisciplinary work, whether you're setting up a team, you're doing a project, requires investment in the relationship. That is something that sometimes we can undervalue. We might overlook and think that it will happen organically, but right from the beginning, setting up the team, that is going to do the project with you, not for you. Together, uh, it becomes very key. In thinking about that, you also have to think about who is therefore invited into the space? Who is the team consisting of? Where are the beneficiaries, the communities, how they are defined? Are they part of that team? And that in a way starts either to create power or to break down the power. So who gets in right from the beginning also sets, might set some of the key elements that will continue featuring throughout the project cycle. The other thing that came out is the invisible elements that are often undervalued yet play such a critical role. The day-to-day -day management that makes the relationships work, meeting targets, being clear about who is supposed to do what, by when, buy in from the key people. Uh, in the group that I was in, Stacey talked about instinct, knowing instinctively people that you can work with because you gel, you may be on very different disciplines, but something pulls you together towards that common topic and how powerful that is in setting up the team. Uh, there are top tips that were given throughout, very powerful top tips, including the fact that we have right from the beginning, we come from shared different value systems, different how we can come together and have common grounds of principles shared. The power of brief and debriefing, what worked, what did not work, how can we improve? The importance of being reflexive, knowing that none of you are perfect. We are all learning from each other. That really is important, as are many other things that came through. So in summary, I think um, if projects, 
community engagement itself uh, lends itself automatically to interdisciplinarity in the way it is conducted, in its methodology in the teams. We cannot run away from it. We embrace it. We find the opportunities that it provides for us. We work with it. And I hope that's one of the big learnings. I'm really excited to have been part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorcas, for that very wise um, summary of the key concepts. I think that captured the workshop um, very effectively. So we just over time, um, and I just wanted to close off very quickly, starting off with a plug for our next um, and final workshop in this series. So this really gets into the practical considerations for getting um, uh, public engagement projects off the ground. And so this really looks at timing, funding, um, and other important aspects like what kind of support structures are ne needed and then also really looking at the complex complexities of measuring impacts within public engagement so it should be a really good and practical session um, following on for this from this one so i hope everyone will sign up and also please share the link with your networks and colleagues and anyone else that you think might be interested um, it's going to be on the 23rd of november which i think is also a tuesday at the same time um, the next thing to mention and to remind you about is that um, where all our resources are on MESH, um, a recording of the workshop, not the breakout session, but the rest of the workshop will be available there. Um, there's also our social media handles and there's also um, a space on MESH for you to share your own resources um, that you think might be interesting, interested to the community of practice that's developing. Um, and then the last thing to say is to please give us your feedback. You'll probably receive an email for, from, all, from, from the team um, with a feedback form. And we really request honest feedback because it'll help us plan the next, next sessions and any way forward. Um, and then I think all that's left for me to do, oh, and Dion's drawing will also be, the final version of Dion's drawing will also be on the mesh side. Um, yeah, and then I think uh, all that's left for me to do is to really thank everyone. Um, thank you to Sean and Vandile for facilitating. Um, for the to the facilitators of the breakout sessions, to Carolyn and Joy for the um, presentations, and to Dorcas for the wonderful um, reflection points, and um, to Nabil and Helen for, um, from Mesh and Interfer to for co-arranging with us. Um, yeah, please get in touch with any other comments, suggestions, questions. Um, it'd be great to keep in touch with all of you.